So before we move on to using the second type of pre-made model, you need to understand a very important concept known as a tensor. TensorFlow is after all named after it, so as you may have guessed, it's pretty key to the subject. So let's find out some more. Now, the very first thing you'll find if you look at the TensorFlow.js API as shown on this slide is this thing called a tensor. And tensors are the primary data structure in TensorFlow programs. Machine learning models literally take tensors as inputs, manipulate them in some way, and then spit out tensors as outputs. You can think of them as being similar in structure to an array. And just like arrays, they can have multiple dimensions. But tensors almost always only contain numerical data, unlike regular JavaScript arrays that could contain a whole mix of objects that you might use or invent. Furthermore, the tensor class itself has a whole bunch of useful functions that can assist in transforming them into different sizes or dimensions or doing math upon the numbers contained inside them and much more. Basically an array extended with superpowers. Now, this flow of tensors for a machine learning model is where TensorFlow gets its name from, essentially the flow of tensors through the model. Now, I mentioned tensors can have multiple dimensions just like arrays. Let's quickly recap what this looks like and the slightly different terms you might hear when speaking about tensors. First, the most simple is some data that has no dimensions, a single value if you will, also known as a scalar value in mathematics, like the number six. Here you can see a little bucket of memory shown in orange containing this single number all by itself. Now machine learning folk like to describe dimensionality in terms of a word called rank. So here the tensor has a rank of zero, which simply means it has zero dimensions or axes if you prefer. In JavaScript code, you've used scalar values like this all the time. For example, when you create a variable and assign it a single number as a value, like let value equal six, as shown on this slide. Using the TensorFlow.js API, you can instead call tf.scalar and pass it the number directly to return a tensor holding that number. Next, you can have a one-dimensional tensor. You can think of this as a list of numbers, just like a one-dimensional array, and mathematicians would call this collection of numbers a vector. And when constructed as a tensor, TensorFlow folk would call this a rank one tensor as it uses a one-dimensional array to store those three numbers. It should be noted, however, that in this case, the vector data stored is three-dimensional. It has three numbers in the array. Those numbers could represent a single coordinate in 3D space in X, Y, and Z respectively. So in that sense, the data itself is three-dimensional. Now, do not confuse a 3D vector with a 3D tensor. In the prior example, the vector is 3D as it contained three numbers, but the tensor holding that data was one dimensional or 1D. If you had four numbers in the array, the vector would be 4D, but the tensor would still be one dimensional with rank one. So the term dimensionality can represent one of two things as you just saw. It can either denote the number of elements along a specific axis of a tensor, like the 3D vector that you just saw, or the number of axes in a tensor. <laughs> in this case, it was one as the container is just a standard one dimensional array. Here you can visualize the array as a list of numbers in memory, all going in one dimension as shown on the right. In JavaScript code, you probably use a one dimensional array all the time to store values as shown. Using the TensorFlow.js API, you can instead call tf.tensor1d and pass it the one dimensional array of numbers instead to return a tensor of rank one holding those numbers. Up next is two dimensional tensors. Imagine you had a grayscale image. Every pixel in the image would have a value from zero to 255 representing different shades of gray the computer could draw. Now, each pixel has an X and Y location somewhere on that 2D image. So to store those values whilst retaining the correct positions, you might choose to store this data as a two dimensional array in your code. Now mathematicians call this a matrix and TensorFlow folk would call this a rank two tensor. Here you can visualize the array as a rectangle or square of numbers as shown on the right. In JavaScript code, you may have already used 2D arrays already like the code shown to store some data for an image or maybe even a board game state, for example, to keep track of what piece is in what location of the board. Now, using the TensorFlow.js API, 
you can call tf.tensor2d and pass it the two-dimensional array of numbers to return a tensor of rank two holding those numbers. And in a similar manner, three-dimensional tensors also exist. A great example of this is a regular full-color RGB image. You may think images are two-dimensional, which for the purposes of grayscale images, that's pretty true. However, a color image is made of red, green, and blue channels. Each pixel, therefore, needs three numbers to produce the color that you see on your screen with the correct mixture of red, green, and blue. So to store the data for a color image, you actually need a rank three tensor as shown. This example essentially shows a three by three pixel RGB image stored in memory, where one layer could be the red values, layer two the green, and layer three the blue. To visualize this, you can think of many 2D layers stacked together to create a 3D shape like this cube on the right hand side, with each subcube containing a number in this case. Hopefully by now you can see the pattern in the code, where as you increase the number of dimensions, you're essentially nesting more arrays inside each other. And the TensorFlow.js code just calls tf.tensorxd, where x is the number of dimensions that you have, up to a maximum of six. You then pass to that function the multi-dimensional array of numbers, which will return a tensor whose rank is the same as the dimensions required. Visualizing beyond 3D is sort of tricky. So I've tried my best here to draw some visualizations to help you see how this works in terms of the nesting of arrays in a visual way. A rank four tensor structure is simply an array of three-dimensional arrays that you just saw. Here, you can see a light blue container representing the fourth dimension. This itself contains a collection of 3D arrays like the ones you saw on the previous slide. Now, I've not written the code for this as it's hard to fit on a single slide, but the principle is the same as you previously saw. Hopefully, this visualization helps illustrate what's going on. And a common use case for this sort of data would be video data that contains a time element. Here you can see that a video, after all, is just an ordered set of RGB images over time. And in the example shown here, you can see that you have three three by three pixel RGB images stored over time, each with a red, green, and blue channel, one after each other, and all contained within the new array. And yes, you can go further. A rank five tensor is shown here. Building upon the previous example, this is like having a batch of videos. Here you can see how each video from the prior slide is now stacked inside a new array containing them all. And it should be noted that there are also some real world scenarios that might need a rank five tensor to store their data from sensors that are more advanced than regular webcams or when using very specific data types, say in the 3D industry. One potential example would be storing voxels, which simply is a fancy word for saying three dimensional pixels. Let's look into this deeper. In the image on the right, you can see a screenshot of the popular computer game called Minecraft. This digital world is represented by a whole bunch of cubes that are essentially the smallest subdivision of the 3D world space that you can have, which is known as a voxel, just like the smallest subdivision of 2D space is known as a pixel for regular images. Now, each one of these voxels has a specific color value, representing different objects in the game that the users can manipulate to create and build whatever they want. Now, if you were to store a portion of this Minecraft world in the form of a tensor, each voxel may need to store the RGB color value it represents. As three values would need to be stored in a one dimensional array, this would be the first dimension, the color of the voxel. This voxel now needs to be assigned a location in the game world, for example, in X, Y, and Z. This means you need a second, third, and fourth dimension respectively, so you can track the coordinates of where that voxel is located in three dimensions. And finally, if you're recording these values over time, you would then need the fifth dimension to store frames of this data. You can think of this as an animation that records changes to the voxels that you could then play back over some time interval. And last but not least, you might summon a rank six tensor. This is the highest rank tensor that TensorFlow.js supports. Realistically, you probably won't ever need to use it for most situations, but know that it exists. Continuing the previous rank five example for recording voxel states over time, you might find you need to record a batch of voxel animations to send to your model in parallel. In this case, you'd need that sixth dimension here to do that. All right, 
That's quite a bit to digest, especially as you typically only work up to three dimensions in your mind, so feel free to rewind and understand the examples provided before continuing. Now, when working with tenses, there's some common vocabulary you'll hear folk often referring to. Most importantly, all tenses have two fundamental properties, data type and shape. So let's dive into the details. Data type is the type of data that the tensor will store. For example, integers, which are just whole numbers, or floating point numbers, which are just fractional numbers with a decimal point like 0 0.2. The amount of memory used to store these numbers defines the range of values that they can store. So as you can see on this slide, int8 stores a smaller range of numbers than int16. Now, as a JavaScript programmer in the web dev world, you may not have had to deal with specifying numbers to this level of detail before. Typically, you would just say, let x equal two and be done with it. But in the machine learning world, it's important to do so as using the wrong type could eat a ton more memory as often larger networks are dealing with millions of numbers in the model. For this reason, you'll see typed arrays being used a lot in TensorFlow.js that JavaScript also supports, even though few people need to use them normally. This not only helps with memory efficiency, but also for performance. If an array only stores one type, then it can be accessed more efficiently too, making your program as fast as possible. Next, shape is the length or the number of elements, if you will, of each of the axes of the tensor. In this example, you have three dimensional tensors as you saw before. The shape for the tensor on the left would be three by three by three, and on the one on the right, which is also a three dimensional tensor, its shape might be described as three by three by six using the same convention. Now rank, as you saw before, is simply the number of axes that the tensor has or the dimensions if you prefer to think of it like that. This tensor has three axes, so it has a rank of three. Axes or dimensions can be individually called out too. For example, axes two in this visualization runs along the cube from the left to the right as shown. Finally, size is just the total number of items in the tensor. If you know the shape of a tensor, you can multiply the numbers to get its size. This three by three by three tensor has a size of 27 on the left there, and the three by three by six tensor has a size of 54. Now, once you've got your data in tensor form, you can now make use of all the powerful functions provided by the TensorFlow.js library. A few simple examples are shown here. In the first line of code, you can see it just creates a new 2D tensor and assigns it to a variable called tensor. In a similar manner, the second line of code creates a scalar tensor with the value of two and assigns it to a variable called scalar. The next line shows you how you can multiply all values in the first tensor with the scalar value you just created by calling tensor.mol and passing it the scalar tensor you want to multiply by. Next, if you print the contents of the new tensor just created by doing that, you can see all of the values are now double what they were in the first tensor that you created at the start. Now, you might wonder, why not just use regular JavaScript to multiply all the numbers by two? Well, simply put, using tensors means you can take advantage of the faster execution on the graphics card or other backends that TensorFlow.js supports, which can do many of these operations in parallel or much faster than vanilla JavaScript. This means your program is gonna run super fast when doing these sorts of operations on huge arrays of numbers, which when you're dealing with things like images that contain millions of numbers, that performance difference can make a huge difference in execution time. Finally, on the last line, you can see how you can even change the shape of tensors. In this case, it takes the 2D tensor from the first line and reshapes it into a one dimensional tensor with six elements, pretty neat. Now, these examples may not mean much on their own right now, but later in this course, you'll see more useful use cases for which these sorts of transformations, for example, when working with image data and converting back to be in tensor form will be input into a model more efficiently. Now, the beauty of having these standard ways to represent data is that the library knows how it can use such data on different hardware types, as it now can rely upon the fact that data will always be consistent in this well-defined tensor form. The TensorFlow.js library works on several backends as you saw before, like WebGL for the graphics card or WebAssembly for the CPU. And this means that the library can accelerate the tensor operations that you perform on the desired hardware for you without you having to worry about what the tensor is actually executing on yourself 
saving you a lot of time and complexity of writing all that code yourself. Now, one final point I'd like to share for consideration is that tenses need to be manually destroyed and are not disposed of like most things in JavaScript. In regular JavaScript, if you declare a variable, let's say, let x equal one, and then stop using the variable x, the browser will automatically clean up the memory it used with its garbage collector, freeing up the RAM and resources for the computer. For a tensor, you must dispose of memory yourself manually using a special dispose function or the convenient tf.tidy, which will automatically dispose of any tensors created within a given function. Now this might come as a bit of a shock to you if you're not used to writing in other languages like C, where you have to remember to dispose of variables that you create that you no longer need as standard. You'll learn more about putting this into practice later in the course, so for now, just realize this is something you'll need to do, otherwise you could cause a memory leak if you keep creating tenses, say in a loop, and never dispose of the old ones. Great, so with that, you now have the 101 of what tensors are. It's time to head back to learning how to use slightly more advanced pre-made models where you'll need to work at the tensor level to pass data in and retrieve outputs from such models. See you in the next section.